Recently, I've posted a series of videos dealing with rules and strategy for the popular games of 8-ball, 9-ball, and 10-ball. In this video, I feature the rules and strategy of One Pocket with excerpts from the video encyclopedia of One Pocket or Viop. One Pocket isn't as popular as the other games, but it is very challenging and interesting, so I hope you enjoy the introduction. The game of One Pocket starts with a break of 15 balls. The breaker chooses one of the two bottom corners as their pocket. The other corner is the opponent's pocket. The first person to get eight balls in their pocket wins. A typical break sends balls toward your pocket or your side of the table without leaving a shot for your opponent. Often, the first shot after the break will be a safety. When a good player gets an opportunity, they pocket a series of balls with good shot making, excellent cue ball control, breakout shots when necessary, and effective use of side spin. Again, you win when you reach a score of 8. One pocket can also involve chess-like defensive battles where players try to gain advantages and take away opponent advantages until there is an opportunity to run some balls. One Pocket involves much more strategy and creativity than other pool games. It also requires a wide and diverse arsenal of both offensive and defensive shots. It also uses and demands skills from every other pool game. You need the cue ball control and cluster breaking of straight pool, the pattern play and safeties of 8 ball, the shot making, safeties and kicking of 9 ball and 10 ball, and the banking prowess of bank pool. One Pocket favors smarter and more experienced players, even against great shot makers. You don't need to pocket a ball on every offensive shot. You just need to get balls close to your pocket and leave the cue ball so your opponent doesn't have reasonable offensive or defensive shots in return. Again, you just need to eventually get eight balls into your pocket. A lag shot is used to determine who breaks first. Both players should use a cue ball if two are available. If not, both players should use an object ball to be fair, and you should clean them off after the lag to remove any chalk marks which can cause cling during play. The player ending closest to the head rail chooses their pocket and breaks. During a match, players alternate break each game. The break must be hit from the kitchen with the center of the cue ball behind the head string. There are no special requirements on the break, although, as with any shot, something must be driven to a rail after contact or the shot is a foul. If you make a ball on the break, you must re-rack and break again. Points are scored any time a ball enters a player's corner pocket. If you sink a ball in your pocket, you score a point. Sometimes, as a defensive play, you dump a hanger in the opponent's pocket, scoring a point for them. Even though you give up a point, this is a good defensive play since the hanger can only help your opponent. It is now my opponent's shot. As planned, I didn't leave much. With this shot, a point is scored for both players. That was a good shot, scoring a point, dumping an opponent's hanger, and getting shape on the 7 to continue the run. You always want to squeeze as many good things as possible out of every one pocket shot. With any foul, you give up a ball where each ball is a point. Any balls made in your pocket when you foul don't count and they spot up. With a scratch, your opponent gets ball in hand in the kitchen behind the head string. For all other fouls, the cue ball is shot from where it lies. All standard pull fouls apply in one pocket, including scratching, not driving a ball to a cushion after contact, double hitting the cue ball, and jumping a ball off the table. Here, Bob is attempting to dump my ball and leave the cue ball close to my pocket. Unfortunately, nothing hits a cushion after cue ball object ball contact, so this shot is a foul. Again, the penalty is one point or ball. Since Bob pocketed balls in previous innings, one of those balls spots, with the score going down by one. Here, the foot spot is not available, so the ball is spotted as closely as possible directly behind the foot spot. If you scratch while pocketing a ball in your pocket, no point is scored, the ball spots, and you pay a one ball penalty for the foul. 
Here's an example where I only need two balls to win with the score at 6-3. Again, the ball spots due to the scratch. I also pay a one ball penalty due to the foul. Some players don't like the opponent reaching into their pocket like this since the balls in the pocket can indicate the score. It is customary for the fouler to spot balls, but I trust Bob. The score is now 5-3 and it is Bob's shot with ball in hand in the kitchen. If you scratch while pocketing a ball in your opponent's pocket, the ball spots and you pay a one ball penalty for the foul. Here's an example early in a game where neither player has scored yet. With the scratch, the pocketed ball comes out and I pay a one ball penalty. Because I don't have any balls to spot, I now owe a ball with a score of minus one. This is usually indicated by placing a coin on the rail close to my pocket. After a future inning in which I pocket one or more balls, any balls that I owe are spotted, as we will see later. This was not a good shot, because with ball in hand in the kitchen, Bob can easily pocket the six and maybe break out the stack to start a long run of balls. Here's another interesting scratch situation. Bob is trying to send a ball to his side, attempting to leave the cue ball close to the foot rail, but he scratches. Bob now owes a ball, but he has none to spot. I have ball in hand in the kitchen and must shoot at a ball outside the kitchen, but there are no balls on or beyond the head string. In this situation, the ball closest to the head string is spotted, in this case the one, to have something to shoot at. Here's another example where we have ball in hand in the kitchen after an opponent foul. Again, the cue ball must be placed with the center of the ball behind the head string. You can shoot at any ball with its center on or beyond the head string. So here, we are allowed to hit the 1 or 10, but not the 14. Now let's look at a detailed example of how balls are spotted properly. Here, due to three previous fouls, Bob owes three balls. He has made three balls so far this inning, so the score is currently zero, but he still owes three as indicated by the coins on the rail. He plays safe on this fourth shot, ending his inning. Because he now has balls in his pocket, and since his inning is over, the ball spot. The first ball goes on the foot spot since nothing is blocking it. There isn't enough room between the one and cue ball, so the second ball must be spotted as closely as possible to the cue ball. Normally, when you spot a ball directly behind another, you freeze the second ball to the first. But when spotting behind the cue ball, you must spot the ball as close as possible without touching the cue ball. Since there is no room for the third ball anywhere between the one and foot cushion, the ball must be spotted above and frozen to the one. Now, all 15 balls are in play again, with the score at 0-0. Zero, zero. Anytime you pocket a ball in any of the upper four pockets, the pocketed ball spots. Here, I don't want to draw back for the 3-9 combo since a scratch in the side would be unavoidable. Instead, I dump the 3 to get good shape on the 9 while pocketing the 7. Again, balls don't spot until the end of a player's inning. Here, I can play a productive defensive shot, leaving Bob up against the stack with no good shot and with multiple threats close to my pocket with a 2-point lead. Now that my inning is over, I spot any extraneous balls pocketed during the run, in this case the 3. Because the ball doesn't fit on the spot, I place it as close as possible directly behind the spot. Here's another example where dumping an extraneous ball is a good play. Bob is trying to corner hook me, so I won't be able to see the 12 close to my pocket. He is also putting the 14 in play and protecting it with the corner hook. This is smart, since he needs all three of the remaining balls to win. Just as in 9-ball, three consecutive fouls results in loss of game. Here's an example where Bob is on one foul, currently owing a ball. Here, he is attempting to kick two rails to skim the 9 and leave the cue ball bad for me. Unfortunately, he doesn't use enough speed to get the cue ball to the cushion after cue ball object ball contact, so this is his second foul. Here, I take an intentional foul and lock Bob up behind the stack again. Now I owe a ball. I must announce to Bob that he is on two fouls, so he knows that if he fouls on the next shot, he will lose the game. You're on two, Bob. Bob tries to skim off a ball to send the cue ball to the rail, but he comes up well short. That was his third consecutive foul, so I win the game. Now let's look at a few end game rule situations. If both players have seven balls, with the last ball hanging deep in the opponent's pocket, your only non-losing option is to pocket the ball with a scratch, so the ball spots. 
because Bob scratched the pocketed ball spots along with another for the foul. The score is now 7-6 and I have ball in hand in the kitchen. In this situation, I need both balls to win, so a good option is to pocket the hanger with a scratch. Because the ball is behind the point, a scratch is not possible here without a risky kick shot off the head rail. But jumping the cue ball off the table is treated like a scratch, so that option is available. Some tournaments don't allow this option because they don't want balls flying off the table, but it is allowed traditionally. Jump cues are not allowed in one pocket, but you can use your playing cue to jump the cue ball enough to bounce it off the object ball and over the rail. Again, the ball spots due to the scratch, I pay a one ball penalty, and Bob has ball in hand in the kitchen. With the score at 7-5, I now need three balls, and Bob still needs one, but at least I'm still in the game. Here, Bob is down 7-5, with only two balls left on the table. He has run six balls already in this inning, starting with a score of minus one, due to a foul in a previous inning. The coin on the rail indicates that he owes a ball. In this situation, after pocketing the remaining balls, the owed ball spots, allowing Bob to continue shooting to win the game. Here, I need both balls, but the side pocket hanger is in a bad spot. A good play is to pocket the 11 and dump the 15 on the same shot. The 15 spots, giving me a chance for the win. Here, Bob is down 5-6 and needs three of the remaining balls. He makes a great shot to break out the cluster while pocketing a wired combo. The 13 pocketed in the side spots, but not until the end of his inning, assuming he doesn't run two more balls for the win. Bob carelessly bumps the 6 into a difficult position and decides to attempt to bank it three rails to his pocket. That was close, but it didn't go. Remember the 13 pocketed in the side during the inning? That ball should spot now, but we both forget. I carelessly shoot the ball thinking I only need one, but I need two. Wait. I made one over there. We never spotted. Oh, you're damn right, Bob. The ball now spots since there are no other balls on the table. If I had remembered to spot the ball before my shot, I could have played for better position on the spotted ball, but now I need to make a bank for the win. Instead of getting the win, I now need to battle Bob for the last ball. Here's another example of forgetting to spot a ball after an inning. Bob is down 3-7 and needs all five of the remaining balls. He needs to hit the left side of the 13 to throw the 12 into his corner. Again, we forget to spot the 13 pocketed in the side earlier. I play a good safe and then remember that we forgot to spot the ball. Oh shoot, I forgot to spot the, the ball. In a situation like this, the players had the option to agree to wait one additional turn each before spotting the ball, so there is no unfair advantage based on when the ball spots. So we have to take uh, each take in a turn, each take one turn? Yep. Before we spot it? Yep. Okay. One turn apiece. Bob plays a nice safe in return. Now the ball spots and play continues. If you want to learn more about this wonderful game, check out the video encyclopedia of One Pocket or Viop that covers all aspects of the game in great detail, including offensive and defensive strategy and moves for all stages of the game, with many pro shot examples of everything. See the links in the description or pinned comment below for more information, including the detailed rules and variations of the game. Have fun with One Pocket, and good luck with your game from Dr. Dave. Thank you.